Hello everyone, welcome to the literary and jury charge portion of the 200 class. Today we're going to start out with an excerpt from Don't Sweat the Small Stuff, and this is called Set Aside Quiet Time Every Day. Okay, ready? As I begin to write this strategy, it's exactly 4.30 in the morning, my favorite time of the day. I still have at least an hour and a half before my wife and children get out of bed and the phone begins to ring at least an hour before anyone can ask me to do anything. It's absolutely silent outside and I'm still in complete solitude. There is something rejuvenating and peaceful about being alone and having some time to reflect, work, or simply enjoy the quiet. I've been working in the stress management field for well over a decade. In that time, I've met some extraordinary people. I can't think of a single person whom I would consider to be inwardly peaceful who doesn't carve out a little, at least a little quiet time virtually every day. Whether it's 10 minutes of meditation or yoga, spending a little time in nature, or locking the bathroom door and taking a 10 minute bath, Quiet time to yourself is a vital part of life. Like spending time alone, it helps to balance the noise and confusion that infiltrate much of our days. Personally, when I set aside quiet time for myself, it makes the rest of my day seem manageable. When I don't, I really notice the difference. There's a little ritual that I do that I've shared with many friends. Like many people, I drive to and from my office on a daily basis. On my way home from work, as I get close to my driveway, I pull my car over and stop. There is a nice spot where I can spend a minute or two looking at the view or closing my eyes and, and breathing. It slows me down and helps me feel centered and grateful. I've shared this strategy with dozens of people who used to complain about having no time for quiet. They would sp speed into their driveways with the radio blaring in their ears. Now, with a simple shift in their actions, they enter their homes feeling much more relaxed. Okay, now I'm going to move on to some jury charge, and the subject is negligence. Okay, ready? Here we go, and I'm going to read this at 190. One of the questions you have to decide in this case is whether or not the defendant exercised that degree of care that is to be experienced and expected from a person of ordinary prudence under the same or similar circumstances. The proprietor of a store or similar place of business owes it to his customers to keep the premises reasonably safe. I think the evidence shows that the defendant exercised ordinary care in the lighting of the stairway and basement that both were well lighted when the plaintiff descended down the stairs and that the steps were clearly visible to any person of ordinary eyesight des descending the stairway and the two steps from the platform. The plaintiff reached the platform at the foot of the first flight of st stairs in safety. There were two steps left before reaching the floor. Ordinarily, a flight of two steps does not require a handrail. But the plaintiff claimed she thought she had reached the floor and fell as she stepped off the platform. There is no claim of any defect in this stairway unless it be the lack of a handrail. The lights were on and the remaining steps were well lighted. Negligence is the gist of this action and the burden of proving negligence on defendant's part rests upon the plaintiff to prove by the preponderance of the evidence that the defendant was negligent in the manner claimed by the plaintiff and that such negligence was the proximate cause of the accident and the injury sustained. By proximate cause is meant the direct or immediate cause of the accident. The plaintiff, like the defendant, was required to exercise ordinary care under the circumstances and if the plaintiff herself was guilty of negligence, which was a substantial factor or a material element in causing the accident, then the plaintiff cannot recover in this case. The burden of proof rests upon the defendant to prove by the preponderance of the evidence that the plaintiff was negligent and that her negligence caused or contributed to the cause of the accident. If the defendant was negligent, then his negligence consisted of failing to warn the plaintiff of the remaining two steps after reaching the platform, or in failing to have a continuous handrail, so as to include the lower two steps. But no one has the right to proceed blindly, unmindful of his or her surroundings. 
each of us must exercise ordinary care for our own safety. It is for you to say whether or not the defendant was negligent in not warning the plaintiff of the two remaining steps or in failing to extend the handrail to the floor. You have the right to consider plaintiff's age and physical condition in passing upon that question. Did the clerk who went down the stairs with her know of any infirmity on her part? You will also consider whether the plaintiff herself was negligent and whether her negligence caused or sub substantially contributed to cause the accident. It is for you to say which one of them was negligent or whether both of them were negligent. If you find under the rules given you that the accident was caused by the sole negligence of the defendant or his agent, then your verdict will be for the plaintiff for the full amount of the damages sustained by her. If you find under the rules given you that the accident was caused by the combined negligence of the plaintiff herself and the defendant or his agent or servant, and that the negligent of each was a substantial factor or a material element in causing the accident, or if you find that the accident was caused by the sole negligent of the plaintiff and that the defendant was not negligent or that his negligence was not a substantial factor or a material, material element in causing the accident, then in either such case, you will find a verdict for the defendant no cause of action. That is to say, the plaintiff can only recover in case the accident was caused by the sole negligence of the defendant or his saleswoman. Okay, I am going to finish up this case here of Jerry Brudos, The Fatal Shoe Fetish. This is called The Evolution of Monstrosity. Here we go, ready? In March, Jerry Brudos went out looking for his victims. Accidental encounters were no longer satisfying enough. He now had the taste of blood and was trolling for suitable victims. Jerry Brudos told police that he came upon Carrie Sprinkler on her way to meet her mother in a department store restaurant. That Brudos was identified and caught when police surveyed the students in Sprinkler's college residence was a remarkable coincidence. Sprinkler might have even rebuffed his telephone invitation only to succumb to him weeks later entirely at random in a different city. Brutus was driving around the street when he spotted an attractive girl in a mini skirt and high heels entering a department store at about 10 in the morning. Brutus parked his car in the store's multi-level garage and went down into the store, but he could not find the girl. On the way back to his car in the garage, Bruto spotted 19-year-old Karen Sprinkler emerging from her car. It was late morning, just before lunch hour. Bruto, at first, was not entirely satisfied with the victim he saw approaching him. He recalled that he did not like the style of shoes that she was wearing, but she was pretty and Bruto settled on her as the victim just the same. Brutos confronted Sprinkler with a pistol in the doorway of the department store and forced her out through the indoor parking garage to his car. Although it was noon, nobody passed by at the moment. As her mother patiently waited below in the department store restaurant, Sprinkler was being driven away from the parking complex by Brutos. Brutos drove Sprinkler back to his home through midday traffic. Upon arriving at his house, he walked her into his garage and forced her to pose in various items of clothing and shoes while he took photographs. He then killed her. Brutos told police that he then went back into the house, but later returned to the garage. He said that he did not like the bra Sprinkler had worn, so he picked out one of his favorite bras from his collection to dress her in. But it did not fit, so he ended up stuffing it with paper towels so he or so it would look right. When police searched Brutos' house, they found the photographs that he took of his victims when they were alive, and later one picture showed one of the victims dressed in a black slip and red heels. Brutos displayed a very typical pattern in serial murder. The first victim was killed unexpectedly, without much planning. The second murder, ten months later, was more premeditated, but hesitating and virtually unplanned. 
The third murder, four months later, Brutos planned carefully and set out to commit, stalking his potential victim. Within a month of that killing, he began stalking his fourth victim. His interaction with his victims, likewise, escalated. Brutos was maturing in his alter action with the women he attacked in a pattern similarly observed in the Albert DeSalvo, the Boston Strangler case. In Portland, 22-year-old Linda Sali was on her way back to her car after purchasing a present for her boyfriend when Brutos approached her in the mall parking lot. He flashed a toy police badge and arrested her on suspicion of shoplifting. Remarkably, Sali had nothing or said nothing as Brutos drove her more than an hour to his house in Salem. Brutos said that it was as if she wanted to go with him. Brutos drove the car with his victim right into his garage. His wife was home preparing dinner, so Brutos tied Salee up and went in to have supper. Brutos claims that when he returned to the garage, he discovered that Salee had gotten loose of the ropes, but had not attempted to escape or use the phone in the garage. This kind of passive behavior of shocked and traumatized victims is not uncommon. Brutos then wrapped a strap around Saley's neck and strangled her. Brutos's arrest, or excuse me, Brutos told police he kept her corpse another day and a night and then disposed of her body. Brutos's arrest was not easy, but he was arrogant and almost challenged police to find evidence to convict him. Several days after Brutos's or Brutos was identified, when he called the girl at the dormitory, detectives came to visit him at his garage workshop. He freely let them inside. They looked suspiciously at the strange hooks in the ceiling and the cords tied off in a knot, exactly the same as the ones found on the ropes binding the bodies in the river. Brutos noticed the detectives eyeing the knots and told them that they could take a knot if they wanted to, which is precisely what they did. The 15-year-old girl that Brutos attempted to kidnap identified Brutos, and he was arrested on that charge. When police found a handgun in his vehicle, he was also charged with weapons offenses, but police did not have enough evidence to even search his garage. The photographs remained there while Brutos was being held on the other charges. At one point, Brutos even called Susan from jail and asked her to burn the container with the photographs and a bag of clothing, but she didn't. Detectives skillfully interviewed Brutos, who at first followed his lawyer's advice and remained silent. In the end, however, Brutos needed to brag and he confessed to the police. Subsequently, his home and garage were searched and evidence recovered. He pleaded guilty and was sentenced to life. His wife, Susan, was later charged as an accessory to murder, and the children were taken away. She was found not guilty, recovered her children, and disappeared. Brutos remained in love with Susan until the end. Later, Brutos appealed his conviction and is now eligible for parole. Today, he denies that he committed any crimes and refuses to discuss them if asked. It is unlikely he will get released, but... He keeps trying. As of 1997, Brutos did not look like he had aged much since 1969. He was a model prisoner in the state, Oregon State Jail, where he maintained the prison's record computer systems and installed the cable TV network. He was also in charge of repairing, stocking, and maintaining the vending machines. These are all highly privileged positions and a remarkable achievement considering he is a sex offender on the lowest rung of a prison hierarchy. Six or excuse me, sex offenders are often murdered by their fellow prisoners, many of whom have wives, girlfriends, and daughters of their own. In fact, several accidents have happened to Brutos in prison, but he refused to name any attackers. Inside a prison, only one of two things count, intelligence or strength. Brutos has both, and perhaps with that, are rare, a rare combination he has managed to rise above his sex offender status. He is considered by guards as polite and not particularly dangerous, and he wanders around the prison unsupervised. 
Very interesting. And that is the end of the Jerry Brudos story. Okay, I'm going to read you some land description. Okay. All right, here we go. And I will read this at 190. Ready? A certain lot or parcel of land situated partly in Henderson and partly in Waterbury and on the southwesterly side of the road leading from South Waterbury to Portland described as follows. Beginning on said road at land now informally at Ralph E. Martin, fenced southeasterly by said road, the land of the Free Will Baptist Society, thence southerly by said society land by a road leading to Shaker Village, then southerly to said road to land now or formerly owned by Henry Atkins, thence northwesterly by said Atkins land and the land of Edward Roberts to a corner, thence southwesterly and to the said Roberts land to a corner marked by a spotted tree, thence northwesterly by said Roberts land to a stone post, thence northwesterly to said Roberts land to a corner marked by a spotted tree, thence northeasterly to land, now owned by Ralph E. Martin, to the first main road and the point of beginning, and being the Brand, or excuse me, Bradwell Farm as called, and the Randall lot as called, containing 110 acres more or less. Okay, so I read that at 180. It was a little bit more difficult to read, which means I know it was difficult for you to write. So now I'm going to bump this up to 190, okay? Here we go. Again, this is land description. A certain lot or parcel of land situated partly in Henderson and partly in Waterbury and on the southwesterly side of the road leading from South Waterbury to Portland described as follows, beginning on said road at land now informally of Ralph E. Martin, fenced southeasterly by said road, the land of the Free Will Baptist Society, then southerly by said society land, by a road leading to Shaker Village, then southerly to said road, to land now or formerly owned by Henry Atkins, thence northwesterly by said Atkins land and the land of Edward Roberts to a corner, then southwesterly and to the said Roberts land to a corner marked by a spotted tree, thence northwesterly by said Roberts land to a stone post, thence northwesterly to said Roberts land to a corner marked by a spotted tree, thence northeasterly to land now owned by Ralph E. Martin to the first main road and the point of beginning and being the Brandwell Farm as called and the Randall lot as called containing 110 acres more or less. Okay, and that was at 190. Okay, I'm going to finish off this chapter from Awaken the Giant Within. Here we go. The crystal ball cracked. The following are actual rejection notices received for these famous and incredibly successful books. Animal Farm by George Orwell. It is impossible to sell animal stories in the USA. The Diary of Anne Frank by Anne Frank. The girl doesn't, it seems to me, have a special perception or feeling which would lift that book above the curiosity level. Lord of the Flies by William Golding. It does not seem to us that you have been wholly successful in working out an admittedly promising idea. Lady Chatterley's Lover by D.H. Lawrence. For your own good, do not publish this book. Lust for Life by Irving Stone, a long, dull novel about an artist. Honda certainly knew that sometimes when you make a decision and take action, in the short term it may look like it is not working. In order to succeed, you must have a long-term focus. Most of the challenges that we have in our personal lives, like indulging constantly in overeating, drinking, or smoking, to feeling overwhelmed and giving up on our dreams, come from a short-term focus. Success and failure are not overnight experiences. It's all the small decisions along the way that cause people to fail. It's failure to follow up. It's failure to take action. It's failure to persist. It's failure to manage our mental and emotional states. It's failure to control what we focus on. Conversely, success is the result of making small decisions, deciding to hold to yourself a higher standard, deciding to contribute, deciding to feed your mind rather than allowing the environment to control you. These small decisions create the life experiences we call successes, 
No individual or organization that has become successful has done so with short-term focus. On a national scale, most of the challenges that we are currently experiencing are the result of not thinking of the potential consequences of the decisions we've made. Our crisis, the SNL scandal, the challenge in our balance of trade, the budget deficit, our educational may, or I'm sorry, malaise, drug and alcohol problems are all the result of short-term thinking. This is the Niagara Syndrome at its most potent. While you're raging along the river, focusing on the next rock that you might hit, you don't or you can't see far enough ahead of you to avoid the falls. As a society, we're so focused on instantaneous gratification that our short-term solutions often become long-term problems. Our kids have trouble paying attention in school long enough to think, memorize, and even learn, partly because they become addicted to instantaneous gratification from constant exposure to the things like video games, TV commercials, and MTV. As a nation, we have the highest number of overweight children in history because of our unrelenting pursuit of the quick fix. Fast food, instant pudding, and microwave brownies. In business, too, this kind of short-term focus can be deadly. The whole controversy surrounding the Exxon Valdez disaster could have been averted by making one small decision. Exxon could have outfitted its tankers with double holes, a proactive decision that would have prevented oil spills in the event of a collision. But the oil company chose not to, looking at the immediate rather than long-range impact on its bottom line. Following the crash and resultant spill, Exxon is responsible for paying a whopping $1.1 billion as some compensation for the devastating economic damage it has caused, not to mention the immeasurable ecological destruction to Alaska and the surrounding areas. Deciding to commit yourself to long-term results rather than short-term fixes is as important as any decision you'll make in your lifetime. Failing to do this can cause not only massive financial or, excuse me, only ma massive financial pain, but sometimes even the ultimate personal pain. One young man you may have heard of dropped out of high school because he decided he wasn't going to wait any longer to follow his dream of becoming a famous musician. But this dream didn't become reality quickly enough. In fact, by the time he was 22, he feared that he had made the wrong decision and that no one would ever love his music. He'd been playing the piano bars and he was flat broke, sleeping in laundromats, because no one longer had a home, or he no longer had a home. The only thing that he had been holding on to together was his romantic relationship with this musical future. Then his girlfriend decided to leave him, and he, when she did, it pushed him over the edge. He immediately focused on how he could never again find another woman as beautiful as she was. What this meant to him was that as life as he thought his life was over, he decided to commit suicide. Fortunately, before doing so, he reconsidered his options and decided instead to check into a mental institution. Spending time there gave him some few references about what real problems were. He later recalled saying, oh, I'll never get that low again. He now declares it was one of the best things I have did or done because I've never gotten to feel sorry for myself no matter what happened. Any problem since then is nothing compared to what I've seen other people go through. By renewing his commitment and following his lifelong dream, he eventually had all that he wanted. His name, Billy Joel. Can you imagine that this man, whom millions of fans love and supermodel Christy Brinkley married, was ever worried about the quality of his music or finding a woman as beautiful as his ex-girlfriend? The key to remember is that what appeared to be impossible in the short term turned into a phenomenal example of success and happiness in the long term. Billy Joel was able to pull himself out of his depression by directing the three decisions that we all control each moment of our lives. What to focus on, what things mean, and what to do in spite of the challenges that may appear to us. He raised his standards, backed them up, and new beliefs 
began and arose and implemented the strategies he knew he must do. One belief that I've developed to carry me through extremely tough times is simply this. God's delays are not God's denials. Often what seems impossible in the short term becomes very possible in the long term if you persist. In order to succeed, we need to discipline ourselves to consistently think long term. A metaphor that I use to remind myself of is, this is comparing life's ups and downs to the changing of the seasons. No season lasts forever because all of life is a cycle of planting, reaping, resting, and renewal. Winter is not infinite. Even if you're having challenges today, you can never give up on the coming of spring. For some people, winter means hibernation. For others, it means bobsledding and downhill skiing. You can always just wait out the season. But why not make it into a time to remember? Okay, that concludes our literary and jury charge for the 200 class. Have a great day.